scripture is taught properly, clearly about predestination. And the pastor who answered the question has also said what he said according to the scriptures, both of them were clear. But since um, our brother still asked the question, referring to predestination after the teacher had taught, we need to understand both sides. One is predestination. Two is the choice of man. If you look at the scripture, the scripture mentions predestination. Look at Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, we're looking at verse 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did for no, them he also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, whom he did for no. There's no doubt. God knows everyone. And he knew all the people that will be born, their character, their submission, their repentance, and their yielding to the Lord, and their faith. And so, whom he did for no. He also did predestinate. Now, the predestination does not come before the knowledge of God. This man will repent. And God knew he will repent. And so he marked him down that that person will repent. This person will not repent. It is not God's action that makes him not to repent. It is his own action. But God knew that before he did, before the man or the woman did what he did. So understand whom he did for no. God is God. He has knowledge. The knowledge of all things, of all people, at all times, in every generation. Then, because he foreknew them, he knew what they would be, he did predestinate to be conformed. The predestination is not that whether he repents or not, whether he believes in the Lord or not, I must save him. No, predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. The predestination is that I know he'll have a soft touch. Jacob, I know, but look at Esau. It wasn't God that made Esau what he was, but God knew what Esau will be. It wasn't God that forced Jacob that he must be soft, he must respond, but he knew him. And now, what God wants to do in his predestination is the predestination of conformity unto Christ. It says to be conformed to the image of a son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Illustrate it this way. Look at Je Jeremiah chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 5. In Jeremiah chapter 1, reading from verse 5, here God said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee for knowledge. Before you were conceived and before you were born, I, the God who knows all things, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. That's not the sanctification of experience. I set thee apart. I sanctified thee. I chose you. And I ordained thee to be a prophet unto the nations. Now, he foreknew him. And because he knew what he will be, he something to do. And you have a choice to make that you will gather up thy loins 
and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. In verse 5, I chose you, I ordained you. And before you were born, I set you apart. That does not take responsibility from the man. God knew me. Of course he knew. And God has chosen me. Of course he has chosen you. But now, do what I'm commanding you to do. Otherwise, I'll confound you before the people. Now, come to the whole of the nation of Israel. God said unto Moses, Go to Egypt, and you'll bring out the children of Israel, all of them without exception, unto the land which I promised Abraham, a land flowing with milk and honey, and a land which will be totally different from the land of Egypt, because this is my will for them, and this is my choice of them. And Moses went to Pharaoh and said, Let my son go all of them the whole of israel my son let them go now they all came out of egypt how many of them got to the land of canaan the choice is still for them and god told them did i say you are my son yes of course you are but i put before you life and death choose life that you may live the predestination he knew beforehand and he knew that this is what he wanted of Israel and yet the same God that said I knew you the same God that said I've chosen you the same God that said let my son go that same God as they now came out he said you know what you have your choice and you have your part to play I put before you life and death. Choose life. Now, if they were predestined and they had no choice and automatically they will just get to the land of Canaan, I will really tell them to choose. You have a part to play. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 1 and I'm reading from verses 4 and 5. Ephesians chapter 1 reading from verses 4 and 5 according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love according as he has chosen us ah, that's predestination that's what the people say now it says, from before the foundation of the world. What the predestination teachers and theologians teach, which we don't accept, is that before you were born into the world, he predestinated you to be saved. And when you were still living in sin, he predestinated you to be saved, and now you are saved. It is not what you have done. It is not your repentance. It is not your faith. It is his predestination. And now they say that the sins you are committing beforehand, before you were born again, the sins you are still committing now, because they don't believe in holiness, the sin you are still committing now, and the sin you will commit until you die. Christ has paid for everything. Actually, you have been saved before you were saved. That's what they say. We say no. Look at this. According as he has chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. That's the predestination. You are born again, and he, he wants you to be conformed to the image of his son. And now it's in, your, it's in your hand. Christ has made all the provision. 
and you should be holy and without blame before him in love. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, having predestinated us, that's it. The predestination is the fact that he knew what you will do, what you will be. And now he has given the open door and you are born again. And then it says, we're predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the pleasure of his will. That's what he's saying. You still have to repent. You have to be born again. Actually, he wants everybody to be born again. But he knows the people that will repent. The people that will come to the Lord. The people that will yield unto the Lord. Look at verse 11 there. In verse 11 of uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Reading from verse 11. Whom in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated. It says we have received an inheritance and then it says be predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things according to the counsel of his own will. Now, we're saved, we're born again, we're predestinated, conformed unto the image of his son. And we're adopted into the family of God. Predestination people will say, that's it, we're predestinated. And we, can, we are saved, and we can never be unsaved. Is that so? Ephesians, the same Ephesians, look at chapter 4 now. We're looking at verse 30. In Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 30, it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Predestinated, he foreknew us. Now we are saved. It is not our works, it's the work of God. It's God who has saved us because he foreknew. And those he foreknew, he also predestined, predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Now I'm saved. How do I live? I live, I abandon the works of the flesh. I bear the fruit of the spirit. Grieve not. The Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are seen with all malice. Why? Why do I need to put that away? After all, He foreknew me, and then He predestinated me. I'm there, I'm there, and the eternal security predestination people will say, You are saved, and you are forever saved. If you are forever saved, why is He warning us, Grieve not the Holy Spirit? You are sealed, but grieve not the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Verse 32, in verse 32, and be ye kind one to another. Why do I have to be kind? Am I not predestinated? His is the foreknowledge. Ours is to yield to the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. I want to remain in the kingdom. And he says, you must be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Look at First Peter chapter 1. We're looking at verse 20. First Peter chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 20. Who verily was for or is talking about Christ. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in this last time for you. For you, for us, he had been foreordained. The, the Lord Jesus Christ had known and had demanded and had sent the Lord Jesus Christ that he will be slain for our sin, for a deed, for known, predestinated. And now, as Christ came to die, who did he come to die for? Is it only the elect? 
the select few of the people who are predestinated, who did he die for? In First Timothy chapter 2, we're looking at verse 3 and verse 4. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Look at verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved. In the mind of God, in the desire of God, he sent Jesus Christ to be our Savior. The Savior of all people who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. In Second Peter chapter 3, we're reading from verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. But is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish. Not willing that any should perish. He wants everyone saved. If it were left, he is our creator. What will he create us for perdition? He created us and he wanted us to be saved. He says, who will have all men to be saved in Timothy that were read? And here, not willing that any shall perish, but that all shall come, all shall come, all shall come to repentance. What he is waiting for, it's not, it's not making us like robots, like people. People that whether they like it or not, they must be saved. Other people, whether they like it or not, they must be damned. What kind of God will that be? That he says, the soul that sin it, it shall die. And then deliberately, he will make some people to sin. Whose fault is that then? He didn't want to sin, but God forced him. No, you must keep on sinning because you must perish. That's what the predestination people, that's what they teach. That God has loved the people he will love. And those people will be saved. Even if they don't want to repent, they must repent. Uh -uh. Why will God do something like that? Look at Nineveh. Yet 40 days, and in every shall be overthrown. If there is predestination, and God said, Nineveh will be overthrown. Yet 40 days. And then the king and the people of Nineveh, they might just fold their hands and say, He's God. He has said it. He sent his prophet. And he said, Go tell them. And the prophet ran away. He sent a whale, swallow him up. You must go tell those people, they will perish. Predestination. And now Jonah came and told Nineveh, Yet forty days thou shalt be overthrown. And eventually, those people, Jonah believed they must perish. He came with the mind. Uh, God has finally pronounced it. And here is their predestination. They must perish. What if the king believed that? What if Nineveh believed that? But the king came down from his throne and told all the people, turn from your wicked way and turn from the violence in your hand. And they repented. And God said, they would have perished if they did nothing. If they thought everything depends on God. They have said we're perishing and so we're perish. But they said no. They had the knowledge that God is not a God who wants the people to perish. Who has predestined them. They must perish. They turned. They repented. And God had mercy on them. God will have mercy on you. Huh. They look different online. Jeez. Wow, that's a lot of rolls. 
When you prefer a dream vacation over a rental nightmare. Let's get you checked in. It matters where you stay. Hilton for the stay. There's something uncommon happening here in the Commonwealth. We're making world-class research more accessible to more students in more ways for less. Solving the world's challenges demands The Lord is a God of justice, is a God of judgment. And when we turn away from what he tells us, he doesn't appreciate in our lives, then he turns. When we're saved, that's by his grace. He wanted everyone to be saved. He foreknew that that is what you will do. He didn't force you to do it, but you repented by his grace because he is the one that gives us the mind, the heart to fear him, to have conviction, to pray, and then to have the salvation. But after that, now, the just shall live by faith. Faith in the fact that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And I believe, and so I confess with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord. And then he turns me from a righteousness to righteousness. He turns me from sinfulness to his salvation. Now the just shall lay by faith. But if any man draw back, ah, why would he draw back? He's predestinated. Ah, uh -uh, it doesn't work that way. God for new. Because of that, he predestinated. And because of that, now we're saved. He says, now the judge shall lay by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. If anyone draws back, God will, God will not say, it's a predestined man. It's a predestined woman. It's a predestined person. Because of that, whatever he does, even if he turns back, even if he goes back to sin, I still love him. And I'll still take him to heaven. No, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Look at verse 39. In verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back. If anybody draws back, where will he go? Tell me out aloud. Perdition. We are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe. We have believed, and then we make up our minds, we'll keep on believing that believe to the saving of the soul. May God help us to continue in Jesus' name. Let's go back now to Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans chapter 8, we're reading from verse 29. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for whom he did for no, he also pre, uh, predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, if you believe that you're predestinated, it is that you'll be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many witnesses. Look at verse, uh, verse um, 30 there. In verse 30, it says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Many are called, a few are chosen. Now the Lord knew this one, and according to his knowledge, he called them. And look, they respond 
he called them and they become the called of God and whom he called them he also justified he called they believed and they were justified them he also glorified is glorified is going to glorify them look at the steps now for knowledge of God predestination calling justification and whom he justified he also glorified glorification at last now as you look at those words for knowledge predestination calling justification glorification many steps are all who start from the beginning do they come to the final end? All who are foreknown, are all of them into glorification? Well, Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you under my wings, my redemption, my salvation, and as a hen would gather her chickens, under a cheeks under her wings and then he said and ye would not i would have saved you but she would not and those people paul the apostle told them the gospel the word of salvation would have been preached unto you first but seeing that to judge yourself, look at that, unworthy of eternal life. Acts chapter 13, verse 46 to verse 47. Then we turn to the Gentiles. He would have saved them, but he refused. They will not change. They will not repent. They will not believe on the Lord. He said, well, the desire speak of you that you will at all of hearing, you close your eyes and you close your ears and you sealed your heart that I will speak to you and you will not hear that I will, you'll be converted and then you'll be healed. He wanted them healed, he wanted them converted, but he sealed up their heart. And that's why the Lord is uh, telling us, uh, explaining everything to us, to us now by spirit. Yes, there's predestination, but it's only the people that endure to the end that shall be saved. Those are the words of Jesus, and the predestination people will not understand the plan of God more than Jesus, the very Son of God. He loves us. As we look at that, uh, Romans chapter 8, we're reading now from verse 35. In Romans chapter 8, verse 25, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's now in our hand. God wants you saved. God wants you to keep saved. He had the foreknowledge, he had the predestination that you be conformed to the image of his son. But there are things that will militate against that. And you have to make your choice. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, farming, nakedness, peril, or sword. Look at verse 37. In verse 37, he said, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. In verse 38, it says, For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. In verse 39, no height, no depths, no any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have a part to play. We have a to now give ourselves to the Lord and consecrate ourselves to the Lord that none of these things shall separate us from the, from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because in these last days, the love of many shall wax cold, but he 
that endures to the end. That's our part. That's our responsibility. Don't just lie down there in predestination and say, well, everything is all right. I'm going to heaven. Whether I repent or not, whether I believe or not, whether I live the Christian life or not, it says he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I pray you are saved. You have the final and the full salvation at last in Jesus' name. Let the church say, Amen. Rise up and let us talk to the Lord. And look at your life. Look at the past years. Look at the way you have been living and safe. Well, I'm there. I'm there. I'm always there. I will always be there. And the Lord is saying now, as much in your hand. I put life and death before you. I put evil and good before you. Choose life and choose good that you may, by the grace of God, eventually get to that eternal abode to heaven. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord. to heaven. Let's pray this moment that God will help us. None of us will stop our journey halfway. None of us no false prophets will deceive you. The journey to heaven demands practical righteousness. Demands daily holiness. Demands our response to the word of God. And God will help us. With all we are hearing, God will help us. None of us will stop our journey halfway. Pray. God will help you. After all the labor, after all the journey, you will not stop halfway. You will overcome. Every challenge, every deception, you will overcome. And you will make it to the end in Jesus' name. I say we will make it to the end in Jesus' name. Realistic. I'm praying that this morning, Lord, by your spirit, by your persuasion, by your love, you will bring conviction unto such hearts and draw them to repentance in Jesus' name. As we have come out of the world, we are going to journey to the kingdom of God. I'm praying, oh Lord, that none of us will stop halfway in Jesus' name. Grant us the grace. Grant us the grace and the faithfulness. At any moment in time, we will overcome every challenge in Jesus' name. Thank you because of our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray.